Well, everybody in this city knows the numbers by heart, but we're pleased to be joined by one of the greatest workers, winners, scorers, entertainers the history of sports has ever seen. And he's also a pretty incredible public speaker. So like the Utah Jazz, I'm kind of going to get out of the way here in a second and, and let him run with it. But Utah's bad. If you're retiring, Utah's a team you won't play. <laughs> Worked out pretty well for Michael, worked out well for me. If you're retiring, that's the last game you want to have. All right, you know what, since, you, since you've kind of piggybacked with that, that day, did you kind of know this is the way it might unfold? I may kind of go crazy tonight. No, man, I was, uh, let's see, that day was a pretty normal day for me in terms of, you know, I was at the office till about 4.30 and uh, left the office, went home, got changed, went to the game. It was like I'm showing up ready to play just like I normally do. And uh, yeah, I just remember being extremely excited. Like there was such a some, uh, kind of a sad, a sadness that was kind of coding <laughs> Staples Center. And I didn't want to have that. I didn't want people to be sad because I wasn't sad, I was happy. And I wanted to make sure I gave them something to, uh, to celebrate versus you know, be sad over. I mean really, maybe the most memorable goodbye ever in NBA history and three months have passed and I think a lot of people thought you might go a little crazy without basketball, but you, you look sane. You look, you look good. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, I've never really been completely sane, so, <laughs> you know, it's, no, but I'm good. I'm how, good. How, do you, how do you keep it? I mean, you have all this fuel, you have all this, you know, competitive desire in you. Where do you pour it out right now? Well, I mean, the biggest challenge, I think, for us athletes is to find what comes next. You know, for a lot of us, sports is such a natural thing. You're kind of born into it or you discover it because you have you know, physical advantages or what have you. But the thing about sports is that, you know, it, at some point it's going to come to an end. And for a lot of us, it comes to an end at a very early age. I mean, I played 20 years and I'll be 38 in August. You know, that's still relatively young by most standards, I would think. And so what comes next? So you have to do a lot of work. I mean, I started working at the age of 20, 21 years old, trying to figure out what that next thing is going to be. And it's very, very difficult. Do you, last night at the ESPYs, you got up and basically said, I'm not through, you know, I'm not done. What does that look like? Like, what does this second act for Kobe Bryant look like it's going to be? Well, I mean, just like in basketball, I mean, I can sit here and say, okay, I have a plan. This is what it's going to be. This is how it's going to happen. But just like my career, it's not going to work out that way. You know, the most important thing is to figure out what it is that you're passionate about. And for me, it is storytelling. It's finding out ways to inspire the next generation of athletes. And how do we do that? How do we tell stories that, um, that, that jump from the page and jump from the screen uh, into the individuals that are watching them and that become something that's actionable? It's not something that they are watching for simple, simple entertainment, but it's something that they can actually use and learn from and embody. Um, and that's what gets me on. So you've launched a film production company, Kobe Studios. How, what's your process like as far as finding a project? What do you do to seek that out? Well, the biggest challenge that we have is, is uh, you know, I'm a big uh, student of the classic, classics. And it's very hard to find writers who have studied the classics but are, were also uh, great athletes. And I think it's important to try to find the combination of those two who understand sports and understand how sports relate to life and those little nuances and details that comes with the training, but also understanding mythology and uh, fantasy and things of that sort. Um, so we create most of the stories internally and then it's about finding the writers and allowing them to do what they do best and take these stories to yet another level. Is it the story that usually appeals to you or is it the character? Well, it starts with the character first. I mean, you can sit there and have a top view of what the story is going to be. All right, it's going to start here, you know, kind of with the art, what the thread of the narrative is going to be, right? But the character is what really is going to draw that out. And what we found is you have a great story, but the character that you've um, built or created, you feel like will respond to a situation a little differently. So that changes the story. So we'll wind up sitting on like 20, 30 stories that we started out and saying, this is what the story is going to be. But because of the characters that we've developed, now we have like 20 or 30 stories just shelved, waiting for the right character to come along to bring those back to life. Have you found any character who's as rich as you? <laughs> as rich a character as you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think, you know, the stories that we tell um, center around the character, and I think it doesn't matter where you center the story, the setting, backdrop, 
if you're dealing with the, conf the conflict, the inner conflict of a person, of a character, the conflict that, they, that goes on within their heart, then the story can literally take place anywhere, right? But it's finding those levels of complexity within the character and uh, seeing how to respond to those situations. I mean, you've talked about that all last year, that this idea that you did play a character at times in your career. Black Mamba was a character, sort of maniacal, wake up at 4 a.m., beat every comer character. But that's also sort of your identity too, right? I mean, where did the character end and the real person begin? Well, I mean, they're all like bits and pieces of ourselves. I think we all have, you know, parts of ourselves that um, are extremely complicated. I mean, none of us are just simply one thing. Right? We all have those moments. And, and by creating the Black Mamba, what that helped me do was identify when to flip that switch. Right? It gave me something tangible so when I step on the court to perform, I understand this is the mentality I'm getting into, which is different than you know, Kobe Bryant, a father and husband and so forth, right? Friend, uh, when I step in between those lines, this is who I become. So it's just my own personal form of storytelling that helps inspire me and keeps me focused. When was that, do you think? When did you have that sort of realization? Uh, it was around 2000 and, uh, 2004, 2005. Did I mean, you have one project you're working on that I know my bosses and I are really excited about, your Dear Basketball poem that was the way you announced your retirement. You're setting that to an animated series. How did that, when did you kind of realize that you wanted that to be bigger than a poem? Well, it kind of just happened organically. You know, I, 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 I was looking for ways to work with Glenn Keane and John Williams. And, uh, and I thought it was interesting to, to take a, an athlete's perspective or the story, a personal story of an athlete, and then seeing if you could then transition that into a compelling piece of animation. You know, fairy tales come from somewhere, right? And if you look around at all the athletes, even, even everybody here sitting in this room, we all have our own personal fairy tales. So there's no different than in animating my dear basketball layer than there is in animating the Snow White story. They're all fairy tales in our own way. So that was the opportunity to work with Glenn. And so he and I sat down, we talked about it. He saw uh, uh, the story and the complexity within it and uh, decided to take the project on. And John Williams, I mean, I, we've known each other for a very, very long time. And uh, you know, I was, uh, was really excited to hear his level of excitement and being part of the project. Do you have a sense for how you want that to look, how you want it to go, or is, it still, is that still very formative? Well, the, the hard part in my job is over. Like, the biggest thing that I did was to sit there on my phone and write the damn thing. And then after that, uh, bringing Glenn Keane on and John Williams on and letting them do what they do best. So, for example, we just had a working session a few days ago with, with, uh, with Glenn, and, and I'm really just looking at the details of things. Every little detail, when I talk about rolling up the tube socks, exactly how is that, how does that happen? How do you actually roll up these tube socks, right? When I'm doing training as a kid and, you know, uh, shooting in my room or doing drills in the bathroom, what were the actual drills that I was doing? What was the footwork, right? What were the placement? What was the placement of the ball and the hand on the ball as I was shooting? All those little details are extremely important because I want kids to be able to view the piece of animation and understand that every detail is cared for. So if they want to learn something about the game, all they need to do is look at the animation and the answers are right there. I don't need to sit in front of a TV and comment, commentate to you about what should be done. I can put it through story. I can put it in the animation. You're in a city where there are obviously millions of experts right here. Everybody's at your fingertips. You can get in every door you want. Where do you go for the inspiration or the counsel just in this city alone? Well, I mean, I, I'm very fortunate um, to be able to pick up the phone and speak to Glenn Keane and John Williams and, and Steven Spielberg's of the world, J.J. Abrams and people of that sort. And, and the beauty, beautiful thing about that is that they're extremely honest and very direct, right? They'll tell you because they want you to do the best job that you possibly can. So um, I, I'm known for just cold calling people. I mean, I'll just pick up the phone, call somebody and say, hey, tell me about this. Or like, that's how I got to know John Williams. I called John Williams, I said, hey, let's grab lunch. He's like, all right, cool. So we sat down, he said, okay, so what do you, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, tell me how you composed everything. <laughs> He's like, well, that's a long story. I said, well, I got all day, so. <laughs> you got all time. I got all day. 
How do people react to those calls, though? Seriously, because I, I know you're kind of you are kind of famous for that, and I think people probably do double takes when they get that phone call. Is it ever funny, or what are those calls like? Yeah, I mean, they're initially um, shocked. They were like, why are you calling me? I mean, our disciplines can be any more different. But like in John's example, um, I, I felt like you know, we all know his music and how timeless it is. What makes it timeless? You know, what's his process? How does he go about creating that step by step? Because I think that there was something there that I could learn from his process that I can incorporate into how I manage a basketball game or how I prepare for a basketball game. And there was. I mean, he looked at things in, 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 uh, individually, right, from breaking down the instruments um, and then getting kind of the, the rhythm of, 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 of the theme. But he started first with just individual instruments and the tonality of them, and then looks at the grand scheme of things. And I said, in basketball, maybe that's what I need to do, because generally, generally as a basketball player, you look at the game in its totality, and then you break it down from there. So after speaking with John, I started looking at things at the, at the smallest level, individually, at, you know, from my teammates and then to the opposition. And uh, that gave me a, a greater control over the entire landscape of the game. And that came from having lunch with John and hearing this process. You're obviously an obsessed basketball player. You sound a little bit obsessed. Are, are you <laughs> obsessed with this too, or, does, or is it not, or is it impossible to reach that level? No, it, it, I mean, for better or for worse, it's there. So there's nothing I can do about it now. I mean, I, you know. I, for, the, for this? For, yeah, for stories. I mean, it's there. I mean, I can't, it is what it is. But does that tell you, does that tell you it's right? Well, I mean, it's, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but it feels right to me. I mean, this is what I enjoy doing. I think, you know, the biggest mistake we can make is kind of sit around and say, okay, what's the biggest industry can, that we can get into? And I, I made that mistake. It was like, okay, what am I going to do next? All right, what's the biggest industry I can get into? That's the wrong move, man. You got to look at what do you love doing? What do you get enjoyment out of doing? And once I found it was storytelling and looking at kids and how they respond to the story and what they learn from the story, that's what's most fun for me. And it was pretty easy decision. Was there a light bulb moment there? Like, was it reading something to the girls or, or did it just kind of happen over time? No, I do, mo I do like 90% of my ideas come from the shower. <laughs> I don't know, there's something about the hot water or something like that, it just knocks ideas loose, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So like <laughs> the Muse film and you know, all these stories that are coming, the, the Dear Basketball Letter and like all that stuff, it all came from standing in the shower for like 20 minutes. Rondo keeps a notepad next to the shower. Do you do you get the notepad next to the shower? Or no? no, no, because I don't, I don't, I first think of why this piece needs to exist. That's the hardest part is, is thinking like, what is the purpose of this piece, right? What is the core of it? And once, once I nail what the core of this piece is, what, what is it exactly that I'm trying to say, then the writing portion of it is pretty easy. Has there been one yet? Has there been a topic or a subject where you've said, yes, that, that resonates with me? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's always the, the, the duality that we all face as people. But nothing you know? specific. I mean, has there one, been one specifically that you've said? Well, not, well there are basketball stories that we've created. There are you know, uh, soccer stories that we've created. There are mm -hmm. business management stories that we've created. But it's not, the what is not the most important thing. You know what I'm saying? It's the who and the why that's the most important thing. You know, those are the most interesting questions. I don't care which show you're watching. You're not watching the show because of the setting of the show. You're watching it because of the question of who you're watching and why do they do what they do. You know, it's those two things. And then what they do uh, becomes an in interesting and entertaining backdrop. I mean, you've been discussing this for probably two years. You know, even when you were playing, you were talking about this. You were going to the office. You were passionate about it. Is that something that you talk to other athletes about kind of needing to hone in on this now before they're done, rather than have that moment when you wake up the, night, the morning after you score 60 and say, what now? Sure do, sure do. We talk about it often and uh, it's very, very important. You know, it's hard when you do something for so many years and um, you start being defined through what you do. And uh, it's easy for us to kind of lose our way and think that what we do is, exact, is essentially who we are. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You, know, you have to continue to evolve, you have to continue to reinvent, continue to challenge, continue to grow. And it's, uh, and it's hard work to do it, but I mean, it has to be done. So you still shoot ever? Not really. Huh. 
Not really. I mean, I'm at that phase right now where it's like, you know, maybe I'll mature enough to say, okay, playing basketball just for fun is cool to do. But it's like, you know, if I'm not playing basketball, I like to be the best at it, then why would I do it? Newport, why? Yeah, I haven't matured enough to just go out there and just shoot. Yeah. You, you, are you, do you watch this stuff? I mean, are you watch the summer league or you're not like firing mm, off any tweets? No, though, a little you? bit, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, that's, uh, I think, uh, I think from a broadcasting perspective, we can certainly, certainly uh, decrease the length of these games because I can't make it through four hours of basketball. Huh. But there's no text to D'Angelo in the middle of summer league. That, oh, that's no, not happening. No, no. no. I mean, like, I, I watch every now, like, if, like the finals, for example. I was able to catch the second half of game seven. Um, I'm, I'm obsessive about what I'm doing now. Yeah. You know, I don't play basketball anymore. But I, if I have time, I'll sit and I'll watch it. So when you wake up in the morning or when you go to bed at night, it's not thoughts of basketball in your head. It's thoughts about what the next project is going to be or how you're going to attack a given yeah, project. Well, not even the next project. It's like, okay, where, where am I going to find the right team? Where are these people out there that are frustrated writers or athletes that have a passion for writing these beautiful stories but have no outlet to do it? Or they're being bogged down by the red tape uh, and not being able to write freely. And uh, those are the ones that I'm looking, where can I find those people? And then bring them in and allow them to create and to create freely. And, that's what, that's what keeps me up. What's a job interview like with Kobe Bryant? It's nothing more than conversation. Yeah. Nothing more than conversation, man. Like, if we can sit down and you can, you know, if I, if I feel like you understand the connection of it, that surrounds all of us. If you understand basketball is the same thing as filmmaking. Filmmaking is the same thing as painting. Painting is the same thing as writing. And writing is the same thing as a lion who chases the gazelle. <laughs> I mean, all these things are connected. And understanding the oneness of the nature of these things mm -hmm. uh, tells me that you get it. And then you're hired. Go write something that's freaking amazing. And Simple. You, and you're finding those people how? How do you find those people? That's, that's the hard part. Because <laughs> it's not like you can just say, yeah, yeah email, put, sit out this question, and then get right, this yeah. very detailed email response. So a lot of it's been word of mouth. Um, and uh, doing a lot, a lot of digging and trying to find the right person. So it's, it's difficult. I want to remind everybody, if you want to ask any questions for Kobe, to tweet the hashtag sports and ent, um, and I'll ask him, be able to ask him a couple questions here. Um, when you look back now at your career, do you, do you feel like it was a story? Like, we're talking a lot about storytelling, about kind of filmmaking. Do you feel as though it was a story from the beginning that you were kind of the main character in? No, well, I mean, we're all the main characters in our own films. You know what I mean? Like, we're all, like, if, if this was VR, for example, this is a VR experience. Right now in the VR experience, we're all here. We're all in the same story. But how individually everybody got here is completely different. So if I'm looking at this VR perspective, you know, film from your perspective, I'm getting a completely different experience of how you got here, but yet here you are, right? So from that perspective, you are the main character. Right, we're all just supporting actors. So it depends on what lens that you're looking at it through. And so from my perspective, yeah, I'm obviously the main character because I'm the one living through it. Did you, have you looked back at that? I mean, you filmed everything from last season. Did you look back at that footage yet? Have you kind of no, explored no, that? No, <laughs> no, no. We, uh, <laughs> uh, editor, um, and uh, who's great, his name is Jim Hessian, one of the best editors around. Uh, that's his responsibility to literally go through hours upon hours and hours and hours of footage and uh, find, a, um, find a great narrative there. Has, did anything from your basketball career prepare you for this? Or are they so different? No, everything. I mean, every, I mean it's, it's the same thing. Same thing. You know, the discipline changes, but the, the, uh, the commitment, the attention to detail, like the, the, the core competencies of it do not change. Only the industry changes. Building a championship team in basketball is the same as building a championship team in business. So when you're looking at building your staff, at making hires, you're looking at it the same way as it's the who's same, a good point guard. It's absolutely good, the same thing. And it's not necessarily the skill of an individual person, but it's how those skills fit in with the group right? and how, how that group challenges each other to bring out the best in each other. And it's not just 
you know, everybody agreeing with you. You know, if you have a bunch of people in the room and they're all agreeing, you probably just got to break the team up. And, you know, you got to have disagreement. You have to have different perspectives. And uh, so I think that friction is what creates, creates something timeless eventually. Yeah, you've always believed in, like, that that conflict is healthy, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what, that's, that's what challenges our views. It helps us to kind of think a little deeper about our perspective or what we believe to be true. And that only either changes our point of view or sharpens our point of view. Let me uh, get some questions here. I'm sure there will only be like, um, I'm sure there will only be like 10,000. <laughs> um, let's see here. Somebody asked, have you chat chatted with Magic Johnson? Any tips and challenges of owning an ad agency? Of owning an ad agency? Yeah. Challenges of owning an ad agency. I, um, well, yeah, I mean, I owned an ad agency for quite some time. It, what personally I didn't, don't like about the ad agency business is um, the lack of creative control. You know, like I, you know, I don't feel like creating something and then having to sell it to you. I think that's tough to be in for me personally. You know, I think it's it's uh, you know, I like allowing the artist to create and then having their work speak for itself versus them feeling like they have to defend their work. So, I mean, that's what's challenging for the ad world for me personally. I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm not sure. What's your favorite movie or TV show of all time? Favorite movie or TV show? Man, that's tough. Yeah. I, thought you I, mean, mo I thought you were a Modern Family guy. Yeah, I love Modern Family as a TV show. I just literally been binge watched Game of Thrones in like a week. Like the whole series from like start to the end. <laughs> like a week. Um, films, you know, uh, it varies from Star Wars to Raging Bull to, I mean, it, it goes all over the place. How is your franchise with Nike affected now that you're off the court? It's really not. I mean, it's, it's what we've done is, um, what we've tried to do is we've tried to build a business that's, that's based on innovation and based on performance um, versus being based on the individual. Right? If it's based on the individual's name, then when that individual retires, where does the brand go? Right? But if the brand is built on innovation, it's built on performance, and I feel like we've built something that goes beyond the career of the athlete and of the player. And so, so far, consumers seem to love our product and what we create from a performance perspective. So uh, I don't really see it changing much. I toured last season. I mean, it was, really, it was really amazing to watch. Every game you played, the lines outside these locker rooms, all the young players kind of waiting to, to introduce themselves to you, to get a pair of shoes from you. You know, I don't know if they'd been intimidated before to come up to you in that kind of way, but have you kind of, have some of those relationships maintained? Have you sort of been in touch yeah, with that yeah, generation yeah. more than before? Yeah, I, yeah, I talk to a lot of them uh, often. You know, they'll come to me for advice or uh, opinions and things of that nature. It's, it's, it is different than it used to be. I mean, when I was competing for a championship, I mean, it's, if you came to me and asked me for an autograph, I mean, that's like, <laughs> like a blood in the water for a shark, man. Yeah, stab him with a pen. Oh my God, that's yeah. weakness to me. You know? <laughs> but as I got older, I mean, it's completely different. Now I, th I see the beauty in helping the next generation, helping them be better. So. Did that, I mean, did you kind of soften th with that last year? Or was it more just you realized? Yeah. I think it was circumstance. I mean, we won 17 games. I don't think we're playing in the June. Right, right, right. <laughs> So it's not, I'm not necessarily a threat, and, you know, like LeBron in Cleveland is not a threat to what I'm doing here and winning, trying to win 18 games. Who's going to be that? I mean, who's going to take that role now that, I mean, you mentioned LeBron, you know, now KD left his team, went to another one of these super teams. Who's going to take that mantle that you had where you were, you were kind of the ambassador for competitiveness in the NBA? Um, well, I mean, you know, it, Remains to be seen, I guess. I mean, I don't know if anybody needs to be that. I mean, you know, everybody's different. Players should just be themselves. And I think uh, the league is set up to be uh, an amazing league for, for years to come with the players that we have. Someone in the audience asked, Kobe, would you ever consider coaching basketball nope. at any level? I didn't even get to the end of the question. Nope. Only soccer, only AYSO. I'm not coaching that Not either, even man. that? No, man. No, like I, I like I'll 
with my kids, like I'll show them some basketball tips. I'll take them outside and play and stuff like that. But, but that, but that's, that's about it, man. But why? Because, because you lack the patience. Because they don't have your drive. I mean, what's the reason? Well, I, I, you know, I, I love teaching. Um, I just think, you know, I, my personality. If I'm going to do something, then I need. I'm going to do it 100% and focus and dedicate time to it resources to it. So I could coach a team of 12 players or I can create stories that um, teach the same things that I can teach coaching, uh, but instead of reaching 12 players, I can reach millions more. And, and I think that's a, you know, if I'm going to invest my time, I think you want to go with something that has a greater multiple than coaching 12 players. Last night you mentioned when you were at the SBs, you mentioned kind of the next generation. Are most of the stories you're conceiving or you're envisioning aimed at children or at teens, or are they aimed at kind of us all? Well, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> with storytelling, it's always a funny thing because when you sit down with people, they always want to know, okay, is, is this for the children's market? Is this for young adults? What, who is this for? And, uh, you know, I, I think the only thing that changes really is the language and the simplicity of the story, so that's it's easily digestible um, for kids. Um, but if we're not creating a story that you know, we all can enjoy, uh, then we're not doing our job. Like if I can't write a story for my 10-year-old daughter about the game of basketball, but have that story have so much detail about certain strategical things about the game of basketball at a really high level that Kevin Durant will read the story and pick up something from. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we are not doing our jobs. And that's, that's not just for basketball. I mean, that's for soccer, that's for tennis, that's for everything. There are certain details and nuances that the best and the best only know that need to be communicated. What were some of them for you? Well, man, that list goes on and on and on and on. I mean, I could sit here and talk about, um, but maybe you have a lot of, because I'm about to get really basketball nerdy here, right? But so if you watch a game and you watch a player throw a pump fake, okay, throw a pump fake, when you see a player pump fake, they generally, if they're right-handed, the right leg always goes behind, right? Now, demonstrate, what the hell? <laughs> so, player gets the ball, they throw a pump fake, they do this, right? See how the back leg goes back? Who the hell is gonna shoot the ball from that position? Nobody, right? So why would you fall for that pump fake? Not in a million years, right? So if a person's going to pump fake, and you're looking at his foot and he's in that position, you know he's not going to shoot, he's going to drive the ball. You just back up, right? Now, if they're in this position, now you know that's a real threat, right? And it's those level, it's that, it's that attention to detail that we want to put into the stories. Um, because I think that raises the level of awareness that these kids have, and they grow up to be you know, very detail-oriented when it comes to their craft. Well, that might be as close as we get to seeing a Kobe Bryant pump fake for a while. So yep, for sure. That might be the last one. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You got it, man. Appreciate really it. Thanks for having me.